Okay, everyone. Good afternoon. I think we're going to go ahead and get started here to try to stay on schedule as best we can. Um, I'm uh, Connor Hall. I'm the director of the Colorado Office of Outdoor Recreation and Industry um, for the state of Colorado. And um, I want to, you know, welcome you here to Colorado. Uh, thank you for battling jet lag and this uh, beautiful weather we're having to be uh, here inside with us for this panel. I think it's going to be a great panel. Hopefully you were able to uh, grab a little coffee um, in the short break here. Um, also, a big thank you to um, our partners at the Aspen International Mountain Foundation. Um, you guys have been great partners um, in, in putting this all together, and uh, it's been a really successful meeting already. Um, you know, it's an honor to be here on behalf of the Polis administration. Um, my office and the Colorado, Colorado Tourism Office are co-hosts um, and major sponsors of this event, um, and we're thrilled to have it here in Colorado. Um, in this state uh, and in this country, the outdoor recreation industry is disparate but massive. It generates um, about $689 billion in uh, consumer spending. Um, it uh, accounts for about 4.3 million jobs. Um, and in the state of Colorado, uh, those, those numbers are $37 billion in consumer spending and over 500,000 jobs, uh, nearly 18% of the workforce of the state. So it's truly a lifeblood industry. Um, but historically, it hasn't had, this industry hasn't had a strong voice at the table. Um, while it's bigger than uh, the agricultural industry, bigger than the mining industry, bigger than the automotive and pharmaceutical industries in this country in terms of that consumer spending, it has not had an equivalent voice uh, traditionally. And so there's been a movement in the past uh, you know, 10, 20 years to give uh, voice, to give uh, influence, um, and to gain a seat at those decision-making and policy tables. And VF and OIA, some of the folks on this panel, really all of the folks on this panel, have played a, a, an important role in that. Um, in Colorado, just to mention a couple things that we are doing around sustainability. Um, one of uh, the, the greatest organizations we have is, great, is called Great Outdoors Colorado, GOCO for short. And this is a program that was created by Colorado voters in 1992 um, that takes lottery revenue um, and, and funds uh, conservation uh, and environmental projects. And so through that, since you know, 1992, through that program, we've uh, pumped $1.3 billion into uh, 5,500 conservation projects in every county of the state. So really the gold standard of any state in the country, a huge amount of money. Um, Governor Polis, who spoke this morning, uh, my boss, also mentioned um, some of the great work our administration is doing. He signed 75 pieces of legislation um, around reducing emissions, increasing electric vehicle use, improving and improving air quality, um, while also helping fund wildfire uh, and uh, resiliency um, and general climate resiliency and uh, drought uh, resiliency around the country. Um, and we continue to march toward, towards that goal of being 100% uh, renewable uh, by 2040. Um, we also uh, shifted uh, millions um, uh, from our budget in the Colorado Tourism Office from destination marketing, trying to get people here, to destination management and stewardship, trying to protect what we have and uh, help people experience you know, the beautiful nature we have in a sustainable and responsible way. Um, and so it's, it's safe to say that we're doing more at the state level than we ever have, and there's still uh, a tremendous amount of work to do. So uh, with this panel today, uh, we hope to showcase, you know, give you a sense of the size and scope and scale of the outdoor recreation industry here in this country, um, in, in, in Europe um, and around the world, and um, maybe give some ideas, some tangible ideas of how this industry can uh, partner with you all um, in this uh, you know, critical mission for sustainability, um, especially in mountain communities, um, and especially as it pertains to outdoor recreation and, um, and the mountain sports. Um, so with that, um, you, know, you don't need to hear me talk too much more. I want to introduce uh, a video by uh, Senator John Hickenlooper. Senator John Hickenlooper is a huge champion uh, for mountain communities, a huge champion for sustainability. I, worked with him uh, for years and years. 
He was our former governor here in the state. He was a former mayor of Colorado. He started uh, his successful career as a brew pub owner. Uh, he's the ultimate politician you'd, you'd want to have a beer with. Um, and he is also uh, in uh, session right now in DC. Um, so sends his regrets, but I uh, was uh, really, really honored to speak to you through this video. Hi, everyone. Senator John Hickenlooper here. I am so sorry I can't be there in person to welcome you all to Colorado, but I appreciate the opportunity to say a few words for the sixth global meeting of the Mountain Partnership. I spent much of August on the road learning about the unique challenges and innovative solutions taking place in mountain communities. Colorado continues to lead the way on everything from conservation to clean energy. In DC, we're working to battle climate change, protect Colorado's public lands, and build a 21st century workforce. Colorado's outdoor recreation economy supports over a quarter million jobs and contributes $28 billion to our economy every year. In Montrose, we visited Mayfly Outdoors, which is helping build a thriving local outdoor recreation economy. American Rescue Plan dollars are helping expand childcare and workforce housing, demonstrating what is possible through public-private partnerships. We also visited Camp Hale in the Central Mountains, which will be protected by the CORE Act. This bill would grow Colorado's outdoor recreation economy and safeguard over 400,000 acres of public land in Colorado. It's the most significant effort to protect our state's natural beauties in a generation. We can't think of mountain landscapes and communities without talking about climate change. We've been working hard to make sure this is a priority issue in DC, and we've passed significant investments focused on drought, on forest health, and on clean energy. I was a member of the group that negotiated and wrote the bipartisan infrastructure law. Alongside historic funding for, for roads and bridges, the bill is, is a, huge for, a huge investment for forest health programs and, and drought mitigation. There's over $8 billion to address the rapidly worsening drought situation in the Colorado River Basin and billions more for wildlife mitigation. Now we're celebrating the passage of the Inflation Reduction Act, the single largest investment by any country ever to fight climate change. It includes $373 billion in clean energy tax credits that will help to electrify America at the same time as we clean up pollution. It'll help us reduce carbon emissions by roughly 40% by 2030. We have a lot of work left to do and we'll continue to turn to the people and landscapes of our, of our mountain communities for inspiration and collaboration. I look forward to working together with all of you. Thank you so much. Excellent. Um, and now um, a, very, a quick video from our friends and partners at the European Outdoor Conservation, Conservation Association, Tanya Basecombe um, and Catherine Savagej, both general managers uh, for this excellent organization. Uh, they'll tell you a little bit about what their organization is uh, doing to marry the outdoor recreation economy in Europe with conservation and sustainability. Hello, and thank you very much for inviting us to take part in your panel today. I'm Tanya, and this is Catherine, and together we run the European Outdoor Conservation Association, or EOCA. EOCA is a charity organization working in partnership with brands and companies from the outdoor industry in Europe. Together, it funds and supports a growing number of much needed conservation, protection, and regeneration projects around the world. The role of EOCA has never been so important helping to fund conservation and protect the wild places and wildlife we all care so much about. Projects we fund mitigate against climate change and tackle the loss of biodiversity and nature, in addition to having a link to the outdoor enthusiast and being beneficial to local communities within these landscapes. Since IOCA started back in 2006, over four and a half million euros has been raised and invested in 167 conservation projects in 65 different countries. Last year alone, EOCA funded projects had a direct and positive impact on 470,000 hectares of landscape. The association is funded by membership and other fundraising activities, 
with 100% of membership fees going directly to support conservation projects. The association currently has over 150 members, all companies, brands, retailers and suppliers working in the outdoor sector and whose livelihoods ultimately depend on wild landscapes. They all use Eoka as a way of giving back to nature. Habitats in the mountains are of particular interest to Eoka because the outdoor sector designs many of its products to be used in the mountains. And if you depend on something for your livelihood, <clears throat> then you need to look after it. So in this international year of sustainable mountain development, the work that Eoka funds is of particular relevance as the focus on raising awareness of the importance of conservation and sustainable use of mountain ecosystems is exactly what IOCA does. And by bringing a large number of companies, many of them direct competitors, together for one common goal, we can have a much larger impact on those fragile ecosystems that we all depend on than by each one working alone. So to be more specific about the type of work IOCA has funded or is currently funding in mountainous areas, we have promoted responsible and sustainable tourism to protect high altitude ecosystems in Nepal, Macedonia, Ecuador and Romania, restored mountain forests in Germany, Spain, Scotland and around Mount Kenya, cleaned mountain trails and removed high altitude rubbish and single use plastic from Kyrgyzstan, the Andes, the Alps, Nepal and from Everest Base Camp, rerouted and restored mountain trails in the UK, Austria, Albania and Bosnia to keep hikers, bikers, bird watchers, and nature lovers off fragile habitats, restored habitats in the Cantabrian mountains to protect brown bears, the spectacled bear in Ecuador, red pandas in Nepal, and vultures in the Apennines in Italy, worked with communities in the Himalayas and the Carpathian mountains to give more value to snow leopards and migrating raptors alive than dead, removed decommissioned ski lifts, barbed wire and abandoned World War II military installations across the Alps to create safer habitats for wildlife and snow sports enthusiasts, worked with remote, uh, remote mountain huts in Italy to reduce or eliminate the use of single-use plastic and other items, and restored high-altitude peat bog in Patagonia, Patagonia Torres del Paine in Chile and the Peak District in the UK. Also, you'll notice from that list that is that despite being a European organisation raising our money from the European outdoor industry, IOCA is concerned with mountain habitats and ecosystems all over the world. Because our love of the outdoors and wild places does not stop at our doorstep. We all love to go to far-flung places to test our skills and wits against more challenging landscapes and experience the kind of nature that we do not have more locally. And also, restoring and conserving habitats that draw down and store carbon around the world will benefit us all as we work to address the climate crisis. So are there limitations to what IOCA can achieve? Yes, absolutely they are. And at the end of the day, it comes down to money. The more members we have, the more money we have, and the more conservation projects we can support. And therefore, the more habitats we can restore, protect and conserve, and the bigger impact we can have on our wild places, the nature around us and the climate. Is IOCA a success story? Yes, again, absolutely it is. And what we can look back on having achieved by competing brands and companies, putting aside those differences for a common goal is inspiring and incredible. But we can achieve so much more. The number of members we have is still only a drop in the ocean in terms of the outdoor sector. And when you start adding water sports, biking, snow sports, and all the other outdoor sports to the list, not to mention other sectors entirely, that might have an interest in being outdoors, you start to see what potential for enormous growth and incredible impact from a conservation and sustainability point of view there really is. Thank you very much everyone for your time today. Great, excellent to get that perspective. Um, so I'm, I'm going to go ahead and introduce our panel now, really excited to, to dive into it with these guys. Um, first up, uh, she was on the last panel, very popular <laughs> panelist, uh, Gloria Schock, um, currently serves as the Executive Director of the VF Foundation and a Senior Director of Global Impact at VF. Um, VF, of course, as a reminder, is a global leader in the outdoor apparel and footwear uh, sector, 
and includes iconic brands such as the North Face, Vans, Timberland, Small, Smart Wool, Dickies, Jansport, and others. Um, there's a much longer, impressive uh, bio here, but for the sake of time, we'll leave it at that for now. Um, next, we have Rebecca Gillis. Um, raised in Colorado, Rebecca received her BA from Metropolitan State University of Denver and her MA in International Relations from the John Hopkins School of Advanced International Studies. Rebecca is the state and local government affairs manager for the Outdoor Industry Association, OIA, and is based in Boulder, Colorado. She joined OIA in August uh, 2021 after working for former Governor John Hickenlooper, we worked together there, uh, and Denver Mayor Michael Hancock as a lead business develop, uh, development manager in their economic development agencies. Rebecca works with OIA members, including manufacturers, retailers, and suppliers, uh, partner stakeholder groups, and state level policymakers to promote OIA's policy agenda on climate, outdoor access, public lands and waters, and strengthening state and local outdoor economies. Next, we have uh, former mayor of Aspen, Steve Skadron. Um, he is currently serving as the dean of the Colorado Mountain College's Aspen and Carbondale campuses. Um, in this role, he focuses uh, the, campus, the campuses on tech, arts, outdoor recreation, living long and living well, and the programs that make communities work. Steve is the former three-time mayor of Aspen, serving from 2013 to 2019. Under his leadership, Aspen achieved its 100% renewable energy goals, established uh, viable transportation alternatives, uh, tightened building codes, and instituted the Uphill Economy Initiative to build good professional jobs throughout the region. He's a graduate of Minnesota and holds an MBA from Boston's Northeastern University. He's a native of St. Paul, Minnesota, but we claim him as our own. Uh, last uh, but not least, uh, another very popular uh, panelist and speaker today, so I will keep her impressive introduction short, Doreen Robinson, Head of Biodiversity and Land at the UN Environment Program. So please uh, give a warm welcome to our panel. Okay, so um, Doreen, let's go ahead and start uh, with you. Um, Tackling the triple planetary crisis in mountain regions, uh, what is UNEP's, just some light material here, uh, what is UNEP's vision um, of strategically engaging with the outdoor um, and outdoor, uh, outdoor recreation and outdoor sports sector? Um, you know, I've heard that UNEP is about to launch a report on sports for nature. I um, would love for you to mention that. Um, and tell us about uh, UNEP's further ambitions in this space, please. Sure. So. Um... I think one of the things UNEP feels very strongly about if we're going to tackle the triple planetary crisis, um, we've got to get out of the environment bubble. It's very easy to stay in the space and talk to ourselves and talk to other environmentalists, but there's an opportunity to move beyond that. Um, this is the triple planetary crisis is a global problem that affects all of society and therefore we need to look to all of society for those partnerships and solutions. So you. For those of you who don't know UNEP, one of the greatest strengths of UNEP, or so we've been told, um, is our convening power. And um, I think the sports industry is also has an incredible convening power. Um, and I think it's a natural potential partner for us. Um, the other reason we wanted to engage more with the uh, sports and outdoor recreation sector is because of its dependency on nature, um, whether it's always appreciated or not. Um, and I think COVID gave us a particular highlight on that. Um, I think we saw, you know, I had got some interesting statistics from my team that we saw things like Alpine Club membership go up 8% last year. Um, we certainly knew in cities people were running and flocking to green spaces when they could get out of lockdown. And I think a different appreciation for the value of nature and our well-being um, emerged across the world. Um, I spent most of COVID in lockdown in Kenya. Um, and that very much it was we saw as an opportunity um, and an awareness raising. So um, what we are, what we, we do have a report we're planning to launch soon on sports for nature. And it really is just meant to compile some of the best experiences around the world of how, and again, it is looking in the developed world, the developing world, the middle income countries, very different stories, very different experiences. 
very different opportunities. But the idea is to capture some of that practice and um, identify some emerging opportunities to get out of the environment bubble and um, increase the kinds of partnership that involve um, strengthening livelihoods, strengthening economies, creating sustainable jobs, but also reinvesting um, into the natural asset. So um, that report, I, it's not out yet, but a little teaser. Um, it's a, a bit of a, some of the findings we found was an absolute, um, through some focus group studies, uh, appreciation for the dependency on nature, but not always a very clear understanding of what to do about it. Um, and so there's a need for those kind of partnerships. The second was um, that in general, we just identified an appetite to um, engage more. The sports and recreation industry was very keen to engage more with technical and different kinds of partners to figure out what to do about it. And then the third was um, really um, strong opportunities, particularly, um, and this is universal around the world, to engage youth and um, both from an education perspective, but also from an activism um, perspective to deal with these existential crises we're facing. So look for that report next month. Great plug, I can, cannot wait to read that report. And I think, I mean, all excellent points. I'll just reiterate the importance of the platform, the powerful platform that uh, the outdoor recreation industry has. This is something that um, in Colorado, you know, nine, you know, nearly every Coloradan does across the country. Uh, the vast majority of Americans uh, do some form of outdoor recreation, and that transcends so many of the seemingly insurmountable, but insurmountable boundaries that we build up. Uh, Republican, Democrat, uh, rural, urban, just about everyone partakes um, in uh, the outdoors and nature in some ways. So there's a real there's a real power there, um, and, and we have to use that um, in this discussion. Um, so thank you for that, Doreen. Um, Rebecca, let's go to you. Um, so uh, can you, from the OIA perspective, can you talk to us a little bit about, uh, you know, kind of the, what this industry looks like nationally and the movement towards, uh, you know, convincing elected officials that this is a, a thing to be taken seriously. Um, just, you know, give us that uh, pitch. And then you all have done some uh, really exciting uh, and groundbreaking uh, work around climate, especially in that space. And so we'd love for you to mention um, some of the initiatives you're, you're working on in that space. Yeah, thank you, Connor. And thanks everybody for having us today. It's really great to be in this room and in beautiful Aspen, Colorado. So thank you. As Connor mentioned, we at Outdoor Industry Association are the National Trade Association for outdoor businesses. So our constituency consists of everything from an overseas supplier in the supply chain all the way to a mom and pop retailer down the road in Aspen. So we're covering an incredibly broad swath of business and uh, stakeholders, as well as goals and outcomes for sort of being in the industry. So, uh, you know, a supplier has very different interests than an outfitter or a retailer, for example. They both fit in the outdoor industry. The great thing that we at OIA continually continue to learn is that there is this common ground interest and value, and that is the preservation and continued sort of endorsement of outdoor access and beautiful spaces and biodiversity. So what we've been doing is sort of utilizing the business voice, which matters so much to elected officials, utilizing that business voice as a constituency, all the way from the very local level, city councilors, mayors, all the way up to the national and international level. I've worked in government in the past and I understand the power of the business voice when it comes to policy making. So if we are able to sort of unify amongst all those disparate sectors in the outdoor industry, if we're all able to galvanize around a common goal, the survival and flourishing of our planet and recreationists, it's a win. And as Connor has already mentioned, it's kind of an easy win. It's easier than other policy areas because there's so much common ground that we have space to play on when we're talking to policymakers and elected officials. You know, every one of them will tell you about their favorite pair of running shoes or their favorite rain jacket or their favorite hike in their local district. And so the outdoors and the outdoor industry has this special 
um, passion-driven place in society, and we have a responsibility to use our voice to protect the things that our industry, quite frankly, relies upon. Another thing that I quite love about our industry and about Outdoor Industry Association is that we provide a common platform for our businesses to walk the walk. What I mean by this is that we've put together a group called the Climate Action Core, where many of your favorite brands, I see a few of you wearing some of those brands right now, get together, put themselves in a room and commit two goals among sort of what we call reducing, removing, and advocating. So reducing and removing greenhouse gases in their supply chain. And then that third step, guys, is what we just talked about, advocacy. So we're making the business case for being sustainable and at the same time showing that it's profitable, profitable and using that platform that I just talked about to advocate for further change. So I really, um, I'm, it's an honor and a privilege to be amongst the change makers in this industry who act distinctly different from any other industry that you might look at uh, from a global economic perspective. Great, thank you so much, uh, Rebecca. And yeah, that's worth a round of applause. And uh, that multi-pronged strategy that Rebecca just laid out, they call that the climate positive strategy. Um, and so it'd be great if more uh, you know, trade associations adopted um, a similar uh, approach. Um, just a, another little plug. Um, all right, Steve, let's go to you. And, and um, let's have a round of applause for Steve real quick because I called him up yesterday when I was driving up here. Yeah, you can do that round of applause right now. Uh, Phil Powers uh, was going to join us from the UIAA uh, and unfortunately got sick at the last second. Uh, he's a tremendous champion um, and, and, and a pillar um, in this space. Uh, and so, you know, I called Steve up. He was in Minnesota uh, and he flew back today, just got in, you know, I don't know, 30 minutes ago. Uh, and Steve is also doing some of the most innovative um, and interesting work in this space, especially from an education and workforce uh, standpoint. So, Steve, can you just tell us uh, briefly about how Colorado Mountain College is contrib contributing to Colorado's outdoor recreation economy, and then maybe uh, delve into uh, this new program you're working on uh, around the circular economy, and um, I believe it's called Make It Here. Uh, just tell us a little bit more about those two things. When Connor calls, I answer. So. <laughs> I also want to say uh, you're always welcome in Aspen, Colorado, which was a habit from my mayor days, but I think it's, I can still say that. So, you're always, so thank you for coming. Uh, uh, when I was mayor, I started an initiative called the Uphill Economy Initiative um, that recognized the explosion in uphill fitness. Some days on our mountains, there's more people going uphill than there are skiing downhill. And I saw the economic opportunity there. And uh, I was able to de develop a number of relationships in the industry that I brought to the college. And I've um, uh, created this program called Make It Here. But before I tell you about that, I have to mention about Colorado Mountain College, uh, the institution I work with. Uh, CMC is a local college system um, in 12 communities in the Rocky Mountain West of Colorado. Colorado's a big square, the mountains are down the middle. We're on the western slope, Denver's on the eastern part of the state. Um, in, Communities like this one, there are a number of our campuses. Up in the Steamboat campus, about three hours from here, there is a program called the Action Sports Industry. So if you want to learn how to make a snowboard or get involved in retail operations, you can study programming there. In the Leadville campus, just over the mountain pass here about an hour, you can learn um, about avalanche sciences, or you can be, learn to be a backcountry guide. And I saw an opportunity for our valley, the Roaring Fork Valley, to be the third leg of that, tri of that triangle, at, where we would, we would work on um, the, soft goods, the soft goods industry. So we have hard goods, we have kind of the outdoor recreation component, and we have soft goods represented at CMC. Make It Here program um, was an, so following my uphill economy initiative, I, I started working inside the college on this program, and I explored the feasibility of an outdoor industry sewn goods program that would train students in five disciplines. Small scale manufacturing, that's doing small batches here in our valley or on the western slope of Colorado. That means so instead of a company, a big company, like say a North Face or a Patagonia, sending things off to uh, the Far East, 
we could perhaps support some of that production locally. We're looking at supply chain management in this program, nothing more critical right now than sourcing raw materials. Um, the program uh, would focus on entrepreneurship and give the students a set of business skills. So once they left this program, they want to go work for a big company like a North Face or a Patagonia or a big Agnes up in Steamboat, um, they would have the skills or they could open their own shops and support the outdoor rec economy. Um, it had to do with rural economic development. As the western slope of Colorado, um, the uh, fossil fuel industry is big out here. And as we transition away, part of, part of Governor Polis's agenda, transition away from fossil fuels, this could be part of a just transition around economic development, returning jobs to local communities. And finally, and the real heart of the program, was the notion of circularity. Right now we live, as you know, in a, in a linear economy. We buy a jacket, we wear it, we throw it out and go buy a new one. My program speaks to uh, supporting circularity, the wear, repair, repeats principles. So now you wear the jacket, instead of throwing out, you repair it or you send it back to uh, one of these leading companies or perhaps an entrepreneur has come out of our program and you would repair the garment and it would get a, it would get a second life. Um, and we're getting a lot of traction around this. Uh, so I spent a number of years working on this and I just heard about 10 days ago that the college has signed off on the program and it went to the state and we've got the official certifications and uh, one year from now we hope to have the first cohort of being trained with the skills that can support the outdoor rec industry specifically around sewn goods and giving all of our garments a second life. Yeah, that's, that's worth some applause. Thank you, Steve. That's, that's such a cool program. You let me know if there's room in that cohort, just if this, this government thing doesn't work out. Um, great. Well, Gloria, let's uh, go to you. Um, you know, uh, VF being one of the biggest uh, outdoor recreation um, apparel companies in the world with a suite of iconic brands, how does VF work with its brands to have, um, who have a direct relationship with the consumers on the ground to advance positive change in those communities, um, especially as it pertains to sustainability um, in uh, mountain communities? Yeah, thank you, Connor. Well, first, I just want to say, Steve, amazing work. I mean, when you just think about the outdoor industry and the supply chain itself and the impact that it has on our planet and people and getting so thoughtful with that approach in regards to how we build out that workforce um, around conservation is really powerful. Um, so I'm very inspired by that work. Um, so I'd say for VF, you know, no question, like so many companies right now, they're putting purpose on par with profit. And that is something that um, absolutely, first and foremost, our employees expect it. Our employees expect us to use our platform to be a force for good and, and using our scale, our influence, our size, our voice um, to advance that change. Um, and for us, where we can lean in to create a more equitable and sustainable world is and in the most thoughtful way with our brands and suite of brands is really what we're looking to do on the enterprise side and then on the foundation side in regards to being a change agent um, in areas that are important to our business. So I'd say the bread and butter of a lot of our community investments and how we work with the brands is in what we call outside matters. No surprise with the outdoor brands that we have. And it's really recognizing the power of, the nat of nature and protecting it. And really, you know, we've gone out to our sustainability team to say out of all of the, you know, with ESG, there's so many demands on the business and everything's a priority. But if there's one area of a, of a blank space that we want to lean into where we feel that we can have the most impact, and Steve talked a little bit about this too, is the raw material side. There's so much opportunity there when we talk about regenerative agriculture and how that actually touches our mountain communities as well. Um, it's vital for us in terms of sourcing our cotton, our leather, our rubber, um, and, and ensuring that we're not being extractive, but working towards more regenerative practices. And how can we work across our industry with NGOs, innovative social investment groups um, to advance this work. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about that in a second. Um, the other area that we focus on too on the outside matters piece and Doreen kind of touched on this too on the power of our youth and the role that they're going to be playing right as the next generations of stewards of of our mountain communities, which is so critical. And so there's a lot of work that we're doing in that space, not only with the North Face and Smart Wool and so many of our other brands, but how do we lift those barriers so that everyone truly feels um, a sense of belonging and welcomed to the out outdoor space? So there's a lot of work that we're doing there, and I'll talk a little bit more about some of the examples there too. 
And then I'd say also, we have so much opportunity on the workforce development side as such a large organization in regards, regards to how we create a much more inclusive outdoor industry and also just a parallel industry in, in general. I'm um, ensuring that more of our leadership look like the consumers that have built many of our brands, which is so critical um, to the work. So there's a lot of work we're doing from you know elementary school all the way up to postgraduate, working with entrepreneurs around mentorship, advisement. Um, particularly focusing on communities of color um, and providing those opportunities for apprenticeships within our organization um, to be able to advance that work and really change the face of the industry from an outdoor perspective and also from um, a apparel perspective as well and fashion perspective. Um, in regards to, you know, you know, everyone's talking about the power of collaboration, right? I mean, these issues are, they seem so intractable and there's so much work that needs to be done and no company can do it alone, no entity or stakeholder can do it alone. And so um, talking about just the shared vision, the shared goals to advance the work is so incredibly critical um, to how we approach this. But one example I'll provide in terms of, as we think about our platform and organizations that are doing the incredible work that we want to support that are innovative and problem solving. For instance, on the regenerative agriculture side, there's an organization called Regenerative Rising out of Boulder. They're doing incredible work on specification and standardization on regenerative ag because this is a very new area and if we can't come up with all the demands with ESG around how do you actually measure that impact um, and standardize it and certify it you're not going to be able to get a lot of other companies on board to be part of this movement and so um, we provided some seed funding on the foundation side for that work they just ended up you know we wrote letters on their behalf. I'm sure many other partners also did the same um, within other industries as well in the food industry too. Um, and they just got a $38 million grant from the Climate Smart um, um, Initiative on a federal level. That to me is just the power of how we can come together to, because we know those resources, that, those, that money, that has impact. Um, so we get really excited about those opportunities on how we can work together across different um, stakeholder streams. Um, and then I just say two, um, just one example, just speaking to how do we inspire that next generation of outdoor conservationists. There's a lot of work we're doing in that space. We've worked with the Outdoor Foundation, which is um, part of OIA as well with so many other partners like Patagonia um, around providing that opportunity for greater access to outdoors, particularly in, in urban communities and welcoming them um, to, to, to outdoor experiences in their backyard and in mountain communities, but with conservation at the center of that work. Um, and I'd say one example of how we've been able to be better together as an organization as Many of you have probably heard about the first all black climb to Everest. Um, it's gotten lots of visibility. Um, the North Face was very passionate about wanting to support this work. Um, they saw that it was historic, that it was needle moving. It's not our story to tell, but it's something that we wanted to fund. They came to the foundation and, and they're like, we, we can only probably put like a quarter of a million dollars towards this. We agreed with them that, you know, inclusivity, equity is the center of everything that we do as a foundation. We're like, we will match that. Smart will put money towards it as well. And then we all made calls out to other companies um, and brands to be able to help them reach the amount of money they needed to be able to successfully summit, which they did. And then being able to use our platform to be able to storytell and change that narrative, which is the power of what we can do as a large organization. So the North Face invested so much of their time and effort in regards to helping them tell their story. They were able to get 5 billion impressions through social media, have over 3,400 stories told, many news stories around the world. And really the beauty of that is being able to change that narrative on who, who should be part of the outdoors as well. And what, what are our diverse communities being able to have the opportunity to see what they can be. And we did recently receive a note from um, a teacher in New Orleans at a predominantly all black school. And she provided a picture of one of her students drawing one of the climbers, Manu, um, and saying that he can't wait till the day that he can climb Everest. And that it was the first time that her classroom felt like they could climb their own mountains, whatever that may look like in the outdoors. And that's a beautiful thing um, in regards to creating that sense of belonging. And I think that's where we can use our platform and in many ways to advance change along with working with OIA and other partners around policy advocacy to advance our work too. Great, yeah. thank you so much, uh, Gloria. That is, uh, that was one of the most inspiring uh, stories I think of this year. I think we all needed that. Um, 
a great example. Um, so let's uh, let's open it up a little bit uh, for Doreen and Steve. Um, you know, you have two uh, you know, very powerful, two very powerful women here uh, representing the outdoor recreation industry. Well, hold on, <laughs> I'm, I'm getting to your part of it. Uh, and um, so, what you know, from education and you know the intergovernmental organization uh, or perspective. What would your asks be of the industry, and, and as concise as possible? And then, uh, you know, Gloria and Rebecca, you know, the same, you know, two powerful folks from education and, and um, kind of that intergovernmental agency side. What would your industry asks be of them, um, all for the good of, you know, more sustainability, especially as it pertains to our mountain communities? Okay, I'll try to be quick here. Um, I, I think the first, we've talked a lot about uh, the power of voice and, and business. I think some of the most marginalized communities in the world are mountain communities, and particularly indigenous people. So it's an invitation to share that power of business. You may not feel like you have an equal seat at the table, but there are others who have an even less equal seat at the table. So it's an invitation to share that power, um, to create that space for that voice, voice and to find those common solutions. So that's the first one. Um, I think the second one is continue that focus on circularity um, and, and thinking about footprints and baselines and metrics and showing impact. And please share that knowledge um, with other parts of the world who perhaps don't have those same skill, set, skill sets. Um, when thinking about value chains, sometimes long value chains are not bad either because they can be a great resource for investment in conservation or climate initiatives in parts of the world who don't have access to those resources. So um, while I'm a, I love the short value chain, in other places, longer value chains may be pathways to getting new resources and new investments and new partnerships. So let's um, be creative about that. The, right now, UNEP is tasked with member states in negotiating a new legally binding plastic treaty. In two years, I mean, it's an amazing ambition. It's talking about removing single-use plastic um, and making it legally binding around the world. There is an absolute place for the uh, recreation and sports community to play a part in that. If we can reduce single-use plastics, um, think of what a game changer that could be for this planet. Um, and then um, the last one is just an, another invitation to be a creative and patient partner with folks like me. Um, we may have a common objective, um, but we're playing by different rules of the game. Um, and we have very different incentives. And I think it's really important to create that space. Sometimes when I've engaged with the private sector, it's like, boom, 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 give me the answer. And I'm like, where the UN? Um, and so, I um, hope I'm not being recorded. But, um, and there's reasons for that. There's reasons for slow and steady and consensus driven. And there's reasons for, for other ways of being. So how do we um, meet each other with that respect for the different rules that we're playing by um, and yet create that space for these truly innovative, game-changing solutions? My, my answer is similar. I was thinking, we're a college. We like to think a little bit, so don't rush us. <laughs> uh, Rebecca um, said something earlier that I think is really important, and I've, I've touched on this uh, through my political years and also at the college. Uh, the real success is in the numbers. It's the business case. It's the power of the business case. And I could sell this to the private sector and to the internal uh, powers at the college because this the sector of the retail economy around re-commerce is projected to be a 75 billion dollar economic sector by 2025 what's extraordinary there is that it's by 2025 that's that's two years from now uh, you can jump onto north face's webpage and they have a pull down tab called renewed that's their circularity option. Uh, as I mentioned, Patagonia has their tab called Warnware. Uh, REI, one of the biggest retailers, a retailer, not even a manufacturer, now has a tab called Used on their website. Uh, this is exploding and it's happening because there's a next generation of buyer, 10, 12, 13, 14, 18 year olds, who are looking to do things differently. Um, the, so what I would ask is um, be open to the possibility that uh, small uh, can work. 
And I would actually uh, thank both of you because in doing my research, I've been, I first went to a number of OR shows. I've been to every one that's been in Denver. So thank you. And I did a lot of research there. And one of the first doors I knocked on was uh, your sustainability teams inside the college and they were uh, incredibly responsive. In fact, uh, some of your leadership teams spoke at our sustainability conference at the college. So a big thank you to the um, big players. Thank you. Um, Rebecca, Gloria, anything from the industry side? Oh yeah, thank you. Yeah, I think to, to Doreen's point around, yes, I think local, absolutely. We're always looking for those opportunities, right? To be able to, to engage with local communities. And I think, you know, with our organization, with being global minded, but locally relevant, um, it goes back to everything we've talked about in terms of just the power of collaboration and shared goals and vision. And, um, you know, when you were just, I didn't even think about this until Doreen was like mentioning it, but when we even think about the long value chain, like, what I have been incredibly inspired by is seeing the traction of so many other brands coming together to address particular issues. I mean, human rights, it's a major issue for the long value chain. I mean, 70% of the people who make our products are women. In some cases, it's 90%. They're dealing with major issues right now. They already were. And then on top of that, you put the pandemic, right? And so how we can work together through, you know, we have a partnership with the UN with so many other brands, including H&M, Gap, Lululemon, um, where Amazon's joined, other industries are coming to the table that were outside of apparel, seeing the traction that we're making around funding globally, locally led women's work at a grassroots level, grassroots movements, where we can actually provide that trust-based philanthropy and giving and capacity building for these movements to support and empower these women, while at the same time using our scale and size and voice for policy change in these countries as well to help empower these women and improve their lives. So um, it's, it, there's, in terms of the local relevancy, there's so much powerful work that um, multinationals can do together. And it's been really exciting to see that starting to, to coalesce and happen, I think it really innovative ways that it wasn't happening maybe even 10 years ago. And adding to what Gloria just so eloquently hit on, you know, we would ask for partners' patience in understanding uh, the narrative is changing every single day. We are no longer, the industry is not, we have been seen as the guy or gal in the garage, might be wearing a certain branded jacket, might drive a certain car, might do a certain activity. Um, we're no longer that. We are the guy and gal in the garage. We are the person of color in an urban city who uses outdoor recreation um, as an outlet and their their definition of outdoor recreation is a walk through city park like it is becoming beautiful how inclusive we are growing the table to be and so we know again we've looked a lot, we've looked very different in the past but we're finally changing and every single person that we get outdoors and every single person who can have repeated safe, authentic, nature-based experiences, regardless of their definition of that, is going to be a conservationist. They're going to be a steward. And that's all we need to do is just have this goal of getting the same people to the table, getting youth outside, the work that you're both doing, and ensuring that this next generation knows that a, there are no limits to how you can play outdoors. You're welcome to have this conversation with us. And B, we can change the world because we're building an industry that has economic and sort of passion power, if you will. So I would just say, let us let us to the table and we are grateful to be asked to participate. Great, thank you. All right, folks, well, I still have a you know, number of questions here, um, but we got about uh, five minutes left, so I'll open it up to any questions from the audience. Just ra raise your hand. Oh, yep, right here. You've spoken about um, the outdoor recreation, but you're focusing mainly on um, very um, a certain 
people within this world that has the opportunity to recreate or the funds to recreate and they usually recreate in areas where people cannot afford to recreate and their values their uses are imposed on those areas where people cannot afford to recreate. The other thing is um, all of my relations speaks to all of our relations. Uh, an elder um, in my area, Virginia Smarch, told us uh, back in uh, their mid uh, 70s, she said that um, we are part of the land and we're part of the water. All that holds us is the skin on our body. Remember that because those insects, they like to recreate too. Those big whales love to recreate. I've seen little baby grizzly bears in the springtime recreating. So think in terms of beyond recreating and focusing on human beings. Show me then. Yeah, thank, thank you for that. And I, I would just say briefly, uh, and, and anyone else is welcome to respond as well. I, I, such an important point. Um, I think, and I've had this conversation with Governor not, and, and others about some, you know, how that uh, recreation verb can be a little bit problematic. I mean, really what we're talking about here at this conference is the outdoors and the environment. Um, and recreation, especially in America, can denote a certain thing um, and comes with some historical barriers and privilege. Um, and we need to do a better job probably of uh, being more inclusive. Re Rebecca mentioned this, but outdoor rec I, I use there we go using it again, but outdoor recreation as you know, as I think about it, does and should and must include all of those things. Any any way that someone engages with nature and and, and gets fulfillment, gets nourishment, uh, whatever uh, from nature uh, should be considered in, in in that space. It's a little bit tougher when you're in government and we have a you know very formulaic guidelines but and anyone else want to respond to that i would just say what other industry or business sector is in the business of healing people's relationship with planet earth like we have such a huge responsibility and we realize that and that is the point of capturing people where they are how they enjoy the outdoors and say that's a valid connection to the outdoors i'm glad you're connecting let's move forward. Um, the mandate is to be accepting and welcoming of all forms of nature connection. That's, that's all we want. Um, so I appreciate your comments. Yeah, um, I'll just add that was partially what I was trying to get at with my point about creating space and voice for alternative perspectives. Um, we know that the nature that people interact with in mountains in many parts of the world means the school fees. Um, it means the food they eat in addition to just where they get their spiritual and cultural identity. And um, sometimes we can very easily forget that. So creating that space for those voices to come through, those perspectives to come through, not just to be heard, but to be part of the solutions in different ways um, and let people define recreation however they choose to define it. That's definitely part of um, UNEP's hope and mandate with our Sports for Nature initiative. Great, thank you. And, and uh, at the state level, we're engaging with our two federally recognized tribes, uh, the Ute Mountain Ute Tribe and uh, the Southern Ute Tribe, to uh, you know bring that perspective uh, more fully to the decision-making table and to support uh, you know whatever they want to do in that in that space. Um, so again, just really appreciate the comment. I know we're nearly out of time now. We're getting a blinking red uh, light here. So just very, very quickly, we're gonna do a lightning round. And um, the theme of this conference is ideas to action. And so in that, in the spirit of that theme, uh, we'll just go down the list, uh, go down the line here. And in a sentence or two, give uh, all of us one 
idea uh, or thought or you know policy concept, really anything that you would like us, uh, you know, and then something actionable that you would like us to take away. My goodness. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, no pressure. Go yeah, no, I mean, we talked a little bit that I've talked a little bit about this on the last panel, but I really do think that there has been this shift from um, competitive mindset to collaborative mindset. There's still a lot of work that needs to be done in that space. I think especially it can be a challenge when we're dealing with mono brands with some of these things too, and how we do it in the most thoughtful way possible. But I do think that the sense of urgency and action, and this was brought up at the UN General Assembly last week for Climate Week, we have to act and accelerate the work we're doing. And the only way that we can do that is if the private sector, the third sector, and, and um, the public sector come together in new innovative ways. Um, to be able to tackle these great issues we have for people and planet. Echoing Gloria, we all have our favorite outdoor brand. Get on the internet, look it up, see which nonprofit partners they support, and go to those websites and learn about the critical issues that those people on the ground are working on and addressing. Uh, give circularity a chance. Give your, let your garments have a second life. <laughs> and I think uh, keep keep the value of nature and what it means in all the different forms um, front and center in these discussions. Great. Please give a, a huge round of applause for our panel. Thank you all. Great. And please stick around. Next, we have a should be a very interesting panel on tackling the climate crisis at altitude by fostering a community of practice. Thank you all. <laughs>